Hello and welcome back. Lecture four, linear AC circuits, starting on with chapter two now. This is gonna be the first of two lectures we're gonna spend on chapter two. This, uh, this also represents the part in the course where we get to return to a more reasonable pace that we're gonna keep for the rest of the course now that we've caught up to the stuff we needed for the first lab. 2.1, the water analogy. First, we're gonna introduce capacitors and inductors. You guys already know what these things are, so uh, this is gonna be review. What we're gonna do here though is try and understand them at a deeper level. One way to look at a capacitor is analogous to a water tank. So a capacitor is kind of like a two chamber tank. You got a chamber on the left here, you got a chamber on the right with a rubber gasket in the middle in that you can't have steady state current flowing through a capacitor, it stops that. But it's it doesn't really care about little short changes in the, in the current. So the current can change all at once. Uh, it just can't, have a steady state value for a long time. As current goes into one side of this tank, then it'll move this gasket over to the right, which increases the, which kind of works to force back to the middle. So it uh, it counteracts the pressure that's causing the current to flow in. In voltage terms, capacitors, as charge flows into them, they increase the voltage on the capacitor and that stops the, eventually will stop the flow of charge. It's gonna overpower the potential difference that was causing charge to flow into the capacitor in the first place. An inductor, on the other hand, is analogous to a water wheel. So here's this water wheel here. The current can't start flowing, can't change instantly. If it does, it's gonna, you can imagine it would break the, the pieces of this water wheel. Imagine the water wheel is really strong though. It'll just stop the current from changing instantly. So once the current gets going, the water wheel is turning and it's got some momentum and then it, uh, it wants to keep spinning the way it is, it'll force the current to keep going at whatever level it's at. But it doesn't, it doesn't introduce any resistance to current flow at that point. Capacitors prevent steady state current and don't let the voltage change instantly. Inductors prevent steady state voltage and don't let the current change instantly. 2.2, derivation of capacitor behavior. Gauss's law for an infinite plate. This is a review of material that you learned in first year. Gauss's law says that the net flux leaving a surface is proportional to the charge enclosed by that surface through the permittivity. Consider a semi-infinite plate with some kind of a surface charge sigma in coulombs per square meter. Then really close to the plate, there's, there's no special direction for electric field to go except directly away from the plate. If the plate's positively charged, the electric field should point away from it. So it points away on the top and away on the bottom. A useful Gaussian surface to use for this plate is a cylinder or pillbox. This is the top of the, of the cylinder and then the bottom of the cylinder is on the other side of the plate, showing this with a kind of an isometric sort of perspective here. So by symmetry, the electric field on the top and bottom should be the same strength and both directly point away from the, from the plate. Now we're gonna work out this, uh, this Gauss's law integral looking at the two different sides of this. So the net flux leaving this Gaussian surface, we've got three sides to this surface, the top part, the bottom part, and then the side of the cylinder, the curved side there. And we're gonna relate that to the charge that's enclosed by the cylinder, which is really just the charge of the plate in the, in the circular part that the cylinder makes when it cuts through the plate. So left-hand side of that equation, meaning the flux is two times the area of the cylinder surface times the electric field, it works out to that. And the right-hand side uh, turns out to be the charge divided, the total charge of the plate per area times the area of the surface that's enclosed. Let's work out how we got that. The left-hand side, the flux related to the charge enclosed on the right-hand side. So the flux is the, the flux leaving all three sides of the cylinder the bottom of it, the top of it, and the sides. On the bottom, we've got E times the area of the bottom, E times the area of the top, and zero on the sides. What? Why is this? Well, the electric field in the bottom points down. Which way does the area vector point? The area vector for outward flux points out of the surface, and that's that's parallel to the area, uh, to, the, to the electric field. So because those are parallel, the dot product just gives us the product of their magnitudes. Same on the top. The electric field on the top points up, which is the opposite direction of the bottom, but the area vector also points in that direction. So because they've both switched sides relative to the bottom, we get EA again. Now we're just using E here because 
the electric field by symmetry shouldn't really depend on uh, on distance away from the plate either. Like the top of the plate is is symmetrical to the bottom. So as long as we pick the same distance away, you can say why would there be any tendency for there to be more electric field at a certain distance away on the top than on the bottom. And then you you realize because the sides don't show up at all by Gauss's law, you could have imagined at first that you were you were taking the distance away from the plate into consideration here, but there's nowhere that it shows up on the right. So the electric field you get doesn't depend on the distance away from the plate either, as long as your symmetry arguments hold up. As you move farther away from the plate, you can't like if you're way up here and this is the side of the plate, you can't really argue that the electric field should uh, should point the same in the same direction because there's no plate over here to counteract it. But as long as we're really close to the plate and can view it as kind of a semi-infinite plate that we're doing here, then the electric field ought to just point directly away from it and not have a magnitude that depends on distance. Electric field on the sides uh, is parallel to the surface on the sides of this cylinder. So when you dot it with the outward pointing area vector, you get zero. The charge enclosed is just the surface charge density times the area that we're cutting through the, the plate with. I said area of the top. It's the same as the area of the bottom, though. Solving for the electric field strength, we find that it's sigma over 2 epsilon naught. This was something you did in first year. If you go back to the formula sheet for physics 1, E03, then you'll find that this, act this, uh, this was a relationship that was on the formula sheet. You also, on that formula sheet, if you're if you're going to follow through and uh, and go and dig that up, you'll find that there's another relationship there, which is E is sigma over epsilon naught without the two. It's saying double the strength, and it tells you that that one's for a conductor. The reason for that is if your your surface is the surface of a conductor, and the other side doesn't have any electric field because it's inside the conductor. So instead of just a sheet of charge, you've got a charged surface of a of a metal where out here is not metal and then in there is metal, you can argue that all of the electric field is just on the one side, on the outside of the metal, which means that you don't have this term here and then don't get the divided by two. Now, what happens if we take two of these plates and put them parallel to each other, but some distance apart? This creates a capacitor. Suppose the top plate is positively charged and the bottom plate is negative, negatively charged with the same charge and the same charge density. Um, as, as is the case in a capacitor, what are, we're going to try and figure out what the fields are. First, let's allow there to be three fields, top field, middle field, and bottom field. Now let's look at this Gaussian surface on the right. This is a cylinder, but we're looking at it from the side, so it looks like a rectangle. Gauss's law says, well, there's no net charge enclosed because we have just as much positive charge as negative charged. So the, uh, the field on the top equals the field on the bottom equals some kind of external field. So the capacitor, whatever field was existing outside originally just uh, exists on the other side of the capacitor as well. And, uh, and the capacitor doesn't really affect what's going on outside. Now let's look at uh, the cylinder on the left. This is another cylinder shown from the side to try and figure out what the charge inside is. We've got that the field on the top and the field in the, in the middle is equal to sigma over epsilon naught a. And this tells you that the field in the middle is just sigma over epsilon naught minus the external field. So if there was some kind of an external field applied, then the field in the middle would be reduced by that just as much as the as the top one is, but in the so or or possibly increased by it if the field was going the same direction, uh, going from positive to negative plate. Anyway, the for zero external field, the field produced by the capacitor, even for an external field, the field produced by the capacitor inside is sigma over epsilon naught, just like we would have gotten for a conductor in this plate up here if we had field just on one side of it. Okay, so the electric field inside, considering the total charge in the plates, is Q over A epsilon naught. And since the electric field is related to the potential difference and the displacement. This is the electric field magnitude. You know that the vector direction does this, but in the uh, it it's uh, opposite of that direction. So notice that if this is the positive voltage, this is the negative voltage, the electric field goes in the opposite of the direction of the gradient of the field. Here we're talking about the magnitude of it. 
we're going to call the constant of proportionality between the electric field, between the uh, charge and the voltage drop, the capacitance. So that means that we've gotten charge is related to the voltage drop through what's, what we're going to call the capacitance. How do we get charge related to voltage drop? Well, we've combined this equation and this equation. You can see that that says Q over A epsilon naught equals delta V over D. So Q is equal to A epsilon naught over D times the voltage drop. And that's what we're going to call the capacitance. Now we can, we can also solve for other geometries like the cylinder using a Gaussian surface, which is in between there. So a cylindrical, a cylindrical capacitor, we've got an interior contact and an exterior contact. This is like what you'd have in a coaxial cable. Now the same kind of a setup with Gauss's law, except this time the field being through the curved surface gives you that the capacitance so the electric field inside and then the capacitance is 2 pi L epsilon naught over ln B over A. B and A were the, the radii of those surfaces. So the we defined a capacitance here similarly to before as the charge per unit voltage difference. The charge on the positive plate, say, per unit voltage difference. There's the same charge on the positive and the negative plate. You don't say the total charge because the total charge is zero. Commonality is that C is Q over delta V. And the method to get the capacitance of a, of a given geometry is by using Gauss's law to find out what the field is between the two capacitor plates of equal charge. Plates being used uh, a little bit loosely here. They're not really plates. They're cylinders. So two capacitor terminals maybe would be a better way to say it. The charge on each of those, the field between them you, through Gauss's law, then get the voltage difference by saying that the difference in, uh, that the, the change of voltage is related to the integral of the electric field through delta V is negative the integral of E dr. Anyway, the capacitance still just a function of geometry. A lot of students get confused by looking at this relation and, and, uh, and think, oh, well, capacitance is equal to charge over delta V. And then someone will tell you, OK, well, you take a capacitor and then you put a, a bigger potential difference across it, like you double the potential difference. What happens to the capacitance? A lot of first year students will say, oh, it drops by a factor of two. Look at this equation. You double the thing on the bottom. So the capacitance drops by a factor of two. But that's wrong. The capacitance is, is a constant in terms of charge and voltage. It just depends on the geometry, things like the area of the plate, the permittivity, and the distance between the two plates. So where geometry, I guess, also includes the uh, dielectric that you put between the plates. The point is it doesn't depend on the charge and the voltage. It expresses the idea that charge is proportional to the voltage across a capacitor. Increasing just the charge or the voltage will increase the other one unless you allow the geometry to change as well. The capacitance is a constant. Energy stored in a capacitor. If you move charge from one plate to another to create the charge difference that's in a capacitor, then you're storing energy in, uh, in an electric configuration. So you're storing electric potential energy in that charge configuration. If you were to release the plates, then, th then they would fly at each other, giving you that energy back. The little bit of work that you have to do to move a charge dq across a potential difference delta v is just the product of those two. So uh, potential difference, electric potential, is the is defined, in fact, as the potential energy difference per unit charge. So you just multiply that by the charge to get back the uh, the energy difference, the potential energy difference. So the work that you went that you put into it to move that charge across that potential energy increase. Then, if you want to find the total work that went into moving all of the charge that's on a capacitor, you integrate the the voltage with respect to that change in charge from the initial charge to the final charge. You have to integrate. You can't just multiply by the final charge because the voltage across the plates comes from how much charge is on them through the capacitor equation. The voltage is Q over C. So integrating this, we find that the total work that you have to put in to move all the charge is a half of Q squared over C. 
Rearranging, you can also write this as half Q delta V or half C delta V squared, depending on what's more convenient for the, the situation. So the rate of energy stored, the derivative of the, of the work, the power that is, uh, is going into the capacitor at a given instant would be I delta V as usual. Before moving on, let's take a quick intermission and, uh, and jump one section ahead to a quick exercise. How large of a surface area would you need to make a planar one farad capacitor with a separation distance of a nanometer and a dielectric constant of 10? So give that a shot using your parallel plate capacitor equation. All right. So parallel plate capacitor equation is A kappa epsilon naught over D. The dielectric constant you may remember just multiplies by the permittivity so if you solve this for the area of the plates you find that it's 1.1 square meter that's quite large and here's a picture of an actual uh, electrolytic that we'll talk about in just a moment capacitor which has a capacitance of one farad you can buy this currently at time of speaking from uh, digikey online for 207 dollars it's a two kilogram mass and uh, and uh, has dimensions of 90 millimeters by 220 millimeters. Now electrolytic capacitors we'll see get a, uh, are able to have the high capacitance that they have primarily not well I mean they cram a lot of surface area into there by by um, by some just practical uh, good engineering but also they manage to uh, have an incredibly thin dielectric. And you see that uh, because of the way the dielectric comes into play in the, in the equation, if you can have a really, really small dielectric that still works, you can get quite a large capacitance. One farad is a really huge amount of capacitance. This is, this is a kind of a difficult thing to achieve in reality. This one has a maximum voltage of 25 volts, meaning that if you were to fully charge it, you would get 25 coulombs worth of charge separation which is an enormous amount of charge i can tell you that um about maybe 15 years ago my uh, my younger brother had a car system with a, had a car with a, a ridiculous sound system that was in the trunk like he you he couldn't carry around anything in his trunk because the whole thing was just a subwoofer and part of that system involved a one farad capacitance which a capacitor which seemed like a pretty big deal so these are these are useful if you want to get massive amounts of capacitor behavior. Basically, the higher the capacitance, the more the thing behaves like what you'd picture an quote unquote ideal capacitor would behave like. Okay, on to how to make an actual really high capacitance capacitor. So this, uh, this is uh, similar to a capacitor that we showed earlier, this one farad capacitor. This one's a different one, but it's, uh, it's got a better view that shows what we're talking about here. This is an electrolytic capacitor. That's the type of capacitor that has a dedicated negative side. You have to leave one side of it as, uh, as being your negative terminal. If you reverse the terminals, then some really bad stuff can happen. Let's explain why. If you were to cut this open and, uh, and look inside the capacitor, then you'd find that the, the two metal terminals are attached to metal plates. So the blue here are the, are the metal plates, but they're not exactly the same. So one metal plate has an oxide coating on it, and, uh, and the other metal plate doesn't. So the metal plate without the oxide coating is in electrical contact to this, um, to this electrolyte inside, which gives the name to the type of capacitor, electrolytic capacitor. And then the electrolyte is really close to this thin oxide barrier on, uh, which is attached to, which is on this other aluminum here. Now, if you hook up the terminals the right way, then by, by putting the positive on the, on the foil that has the uh, the electrolyte barrier on it, the oxide layer on it as a barrier to the electrolyte, then uh, it's, it's all good. That's fine. The chemical reaction works to, to reinforce this barrier and would, if anything, try and build up more oxide, but charge can't actually penetrate this oxide. The aluminum forms a, uh, a non-penetrating oxide. So unlike iron, which, um, which in the presence of air will rust and form a, a permeable oxide layer. The oxide on aluminum is a passivating oxide and, uh, and the same thing happens when it's in this electrolyte. So we have an oxide layer that resists the flow of, um, of electrical charge and this means we can have an incredibly thick effective 
dielectric layer between our capacitor plates. So even though the, the plates look like they're separated by this liquid barrier, the a liquid is in electrical contact with this with the uh, with the plate here on the on the left, or the, I guess I should say the foil on the left, which is the anode. So the anode side of the capacitor is actually you can consider it as the the metal and the electrolyte together then the cathode is the the metal with the oxide layer and the dielectric layer is just this really thin oxide so that combined with the fact that you can put this all in kind of a like a a tootsie roll structure and wrap it up inside of uh inside of a casing like this means you is the, is the reason that you can get really high capacitances from these that super thin oxide layer which forms such a good barrier the downside of this is that if you were to hook up this capacitor backwards you were to put positive on the on the anode and negative on the cathode then you'd find that electrical current would flow in the uh, that electrical current or rather the potential difference would drive this reaction backwards which allows electrical current to flow through the capacitor so it's not acting as a capacitor anymore it's acting as a low resistance resistor limited by just the the uh, the resistance through this electrolyte which given the the surface area is going to be quite low so that'll heat up quite quickly and um, cause a really loud explosion uh, that can you know splash acid on you and do all kinds of nasty stuff so bottom line is make sure to only put negative on the negative terminal of an electrolytic capacitor. If you want to use this in AC, you have to make sure that there's enough of a DC bias that this uh, that the negative side never dips into a, uh, a more positive voltage than the other side. Now let's start talking about inductors. Inductors are kind of the opposite of capacitors in a lot of ways, and in some ways uh, they share some similarities on that end of the spectrum. So while resistors are energy dissipation devices, inductors are energy storage devices like capacitors. Ampere's law was something you, uh, you knew back in first year. Here it is in maybe a different form in terms of current density. So it says that the uh, line integral of the magnetic field around, uh, around a closed path is equal to a constant times the current that's enclosed by that path, so mu naught times the surface integral of the current density dotted with the surface area vector. Now, let's look at a, an idea for a, a solenoid. So, uh, so we're going to try and derive the magnetic field in and around a solenoid. Now, the pictures here have already shown us the direction of the magnetic field in the solenoid. Let's pretend that we don't already know that, and we're going to try and say, all right, we've got some current going around the perimeter of the solenoid. It's, uh, it's a really tightly wrapped solenoid, so it's it's got a lot of windings around the perimeter and there's current going around it. Maybe we can express it as a current per unit length if it's really tightly wrapped rather than worry about the details about how many turns there are. And we're going to try and come up with arguments for which way the magnetic field should be pointing. First, consider this outer loop here that goes around the, the solenoid. It's coaxial with the solenoid. Now this loop doesn't enclose any current. There's no current passing through the loop, so this last integral will be zero. And by symmetry, you can say, well, the magnetic field ought to be going in some, uh, in the same direction on one part of it as it is on the other. So that means from our left integral that the magnetic field in the tangential direction to this loop is zero. You could repeat that for a loop inside the solenoid and come up with the same conclusion, the tangential direction for magnetic field around, uh, around this loop is zero. And maybe you'd want to call that the um, the around direction or the azimuthal direction for the magnetic field, so that's a zero. Now, uh, looking inside the this uh, this big loop, we've got another loop drawn here. So we know that the tangential components of that are zero. This loop also doesn't enclose a current, but uh, maybe there's still a radial component, like one along this direction and one along this direction, but they're just canceling themselves out here. However, consider that. Uh, that if you reverse the direction of the current, whatever the direction of the magnetic field is should also swap. But reversing the direction of the current can also be viewed if you were to like look at this solenoid from the other end. So if we were to look at the solenoid from the other end, then whatever direction the uh, magnetic field is going should look the opposite. If we have an axial component like the one shown, that would swap. But if we were to if we had a radial component, say the magnetic field went radially outwards for this direction of current, then looking at it from the other end, it should still go radially outwards, but it's supposed to switch directions if you switch the current. And since that didn't happen, 
therefore there can't be a radial component. Anyway, all of that is just to say that there's only an axial component for the magnetic field in a solenoid. Now let's try and figure out what that axial component is. Is there an axial component outside the solenoid or is it just inside? Consider a rectangular loop. Now let's put this loop first outside the solenoid completely. Then we take one branch of it and move it really far away over to infinitely far away. Then because that's super far from the solenoid, the solenoid's a finite thing. It can't have magnetic field created everywhere because that would require an infinite energy. So that means that there's no magnetic field on that branch. Okay, now imagine moving that branch back close again. And we can say that since this out exterior path doesn't enclose, not the one that's drawn, but imagine the rectangles move to the right still, this exterior path doesn't enclose any current, then the magnetic field integrated around the entire path by Ampere's law has to be zero. We know the radial parts are al already zero. We know the right-hand side is zero by this argument over there. Therefore, the internal part has to be zero as well. So uh, there's no magnetic field outside the solenoid. All right, now move part of the loop inside the solenoid here, and we're left with just this one piece, which has to be all of the, uh, now because we're enclosing a current, we suddenly can find out what the magnetic field is along this part. It's related to the current enclosed. So B dot the length of this has to be equal to mu naught times the current enclosed, which would be the current, uh, the current density times the length. We've got that written down below here. So L times B is L times mu naught K. K is the current density. It's current per length, not area. Hence the magnetic field inside the solenoid is mu naught K, or if you want to find out what K is, Ni divided by L. And so we have the magnetic field is mu naught Ni over L. Same formula that you had on the, first, on the formula sheet back in first year. You can find the direction of the magnetic field using the right hand rule. So if you wrap your fingers in the direction of the current flow, then your thumb will point in the direction of the magnetic north created by the solenoid. All right, so this, uh, this magnetic field that shows up inside a solenoid um, causes, uh, causes a flux to appear inside the solenoid if there wasn't one originally. So as you turn a solenoid on, it starts fluxing itself, and then that creates a back EMF because nature abhors a change in flux. So the solenoid starts out like, look at all this flux I've got, and it is none. And then you turn on the solenoid by running a current through it, and um, the, the magnetic flux through it increases, which in turn causes uh, a potential to show up that counteracts the change in flux that created it. So basically, solenoids in circuits behave like they don't like having their current changed. This is what's going to give rise to an inductor. Let's go and derive exactly how that shows up. So Faraday's law, just to remind you, is the uh, path integral of electric field with respect to length is related to the negative rate of change of magnetic flux going through that path. The path integral around a given loop of the solenoid, so we go around just one loop in the, in the direction of the, of the current, and we'll find that the path integral is, uh, is negative the potential difference around that loop from the start to the end, not going exactly quite back to the, the same point, but maybe geometrically the same point because they're really close together, but not actually uh, going and, and touching the final point. As the magnetic field is uniform in the interior, we can just do this integral by multiplying the magnetic field by the area. This is the magnetic field we had earlier. And so per loop, the potential difference is the rate of change of mu naught ni over l times the area. The total EMF would be if we were to add up the EMF through all the different loops of a solenoid. So we just multiply this number by n. That makes it an n squared in the top there. And so you have that the potential difference is proportional to the rate of change of the current through this proportionality constant in front. Like with capacitance, we're going to call the proportionality constant that relates voltage and current uh, the inductance of the solenoid. So the inductance is defined in terms of the potential difference per uh, change in current with respect to time. Higher inductance means that it will exert a larger potential difference per changing current.
We can also calculate the inductance of concentric conducting cylinders. So suppose you've got a cylinder interior and a cylinder outside, and then there's a current going this way and a current coming back like you'd have in a coaxial cable. This time, the current on the inside creates a magnetic field which is in the az azimuthal direction. So the magnetic field using Ampere's law, again, um, easier to get this time because the, uh, the, the path encloses a very obvious amount of current, although this time it does depend on the radius, mu naught i over 2 pi r, another one of those formulas from the first year formula sheet that you may or may not have remembered how to derive at the time. Uh, if you go back, you'll find that there were long answer questions on most of the exams and practice exams in, uh, in 1 EO3 that required you to derive this. Now, the flux that we've got, let's take a path now, maybe from the top across and then down and then back along the interior cylinder and back up to the top. So looking at the magnetic field that's going through that, we'd have uh, the integral of that magnetic field as a function of position. Unlike in first year, you guys know how to do this integral pretty easily now. So you can say that this is mu naught L ln B over A divided by two pi I. So the EMF created by saying the potential difference is the derivative with respect to time of the flux turns out to be just mu naught i ln b over a over 2 pi del i by del t using the inductor rule that delta v is equal to l times del i by del t we can say the inductance of concentric cylinders with axially directed current like in a coax cable is mu naught l over 2 pi ln of b over a so the inductance increases per unit length and it uh, it depends on the size of the the relative difference between the coaxial cables. So you'll get a bigger inductance if you have uh, a larger outer radius relative to the inner radius. Energy stored in inductors. Like capacitors, inductors store energy. The rate of energy storage has the same form, the little bit of work that you put into an inductor by moving a little bit of charge across a potential difference is just the product of the little bit of charge and the potential difference. Now, using the inductor rule that the voltage is equal to L times the rate of change of current, and then substituting in that the rate of change of charge with respect to time is itself the current, we can rewrite this as W dot is equal to L I dot times I. And then uh, considering the chain rule, you can see that this is the derivative of one half L I squared. Now integrate both sides and find that W is equal to a half L I squared. Behavior of circuits with inductance and capacitance. All right, so let's consider this circuit right here. We've got a power, we've got a power supply, we've got some kind of a switch, we've got a resistor, and we've got a capacitor. And we're going to look at what happens if the capacitor is initially uncharged and you close the switch. Well, what happens is the voltage on a capacitor can't change instantly. So uh, qualitatively, what you expect is that initially the, the voltage is, uh, is still zero if it was zero at the beginning. Why can't it change instantly? Because the charge on a capacitor determines the voltage across it. So since it started off as zero, it's gonna be zero uh, right after you close the switch. Now, that puts a voltage across this resistor, and voltages across resistors means current flow. So when current flows and piles onto the capacitor, over enough time, the voltage on the capacitor will start to increase until it reaches some saturation value. Why will it reach a saturation value? Well, once the voltage on the capacitor is equal to the voltage on the supply, if it were ever to get to that point, then there's no more voltage across this resistor, and so no current flows. Really, it never actually gets there. It can get as, as close as you may ever want it to get, as close as you care to look, as many decimals as you like, if you wait long enough. It exponentially approaches this. Now, how does it approach it? So that's sort of a qualitative uh, description. How does it approach it? It's going to depend on the size of the capacitor. If it's a low capacitance, then it'll tend to fill up a little bit more quickly because it doesn't take as much voltage to uh, or as much charge to get you to a given voltage. And similarly, if it's a low resistor, then it's going to, uh, it's going to fill up 
quite quickly as well because the same starting potential difference will produce a bigger current that means it fills up faster. So both of those effects tell you that you expect that the speed of this will increase if the capacitance is lower and if the resistance is lower. Okay, that's the qualitative description. Now let's look at the quantitative description. You can use Kirchhoff's rules and just write the uh, voltage around this loop, so up this way has to be equal to the voltage across this way, IR across the resistor and delta VC. Then we substitute in what we know about the current in here based on its rate of change of it being the rate of change of charge on the capacitor. So that lets you relate it to the capacitor's voltage. This is a differential equation. It's a first order differential equation, so it's among the easiest that you were solving in the first term of second year. Still, that might have been a while. So um, feel free to go back and, and uh, check out your notes, but don't feel bad. The solution is just V times uh, 1 minus E to the negative T by RC. Now, in first year physics, they showed you this derivation, but most of the time you didn't use that if you wanted to solve a capacitor circuit like this. What you did is defined a time constant, tau is equal to RC, and then you just knew that if you wanted to change what was happening in a in a circuit like this, so a circuit involving a resistor and capacitor, you knew the you remembered the shape of this curve, and okay, well, it's going to charge up according to this uh, time constant, tau. So one minus e to the negative t upon tau. Uh, something that would have been quite helpful in first year. Maybe you knew this at the time. Maybe you didn't uh, didn't pick up on it till second year. But uh, a quick way to solve this these sorts of circuits without having to bother with the differential equation is to one, find the time constant, two, find whatever the initial value that you're looking for is, so whether it's the current in the capacitor or the voltage in the capacitor or the current or voltage on the resistor, whatever you want in this sort of circuit, then find what the final value of it is, so the value after you wait a long time, and then just write that it's gonna exponentially approach that final value with an equation like this. So if you look at what this equation does, it's gonna change from x initial, when t equals zero, to x final, when t gets very large and the exponential term kills this, uh, kills this second term here, and it approaches it with, uh, with a speed according to a time constant tau. Okay, so we talked about this from a couple of different ways. First, we introduced it from a qualitative perspective where we just start thinking about what's gonna happen when you look at this based on how we know capacitors behave, how we know resistors behave. And then we talked about it from a, a differential equation perspective. And we talked about it in term, and you can solve that directly, or you can talk about it from a time constant perspective using the, the kind of things that you did in first year and just sort of having these memorized. And you might be asking yourself, okay, well, what which one is the best? What method should I use, should I actually know to use this, uh, to take care of this sort of a circuit? And the answer is all of them. Those are, those are all valid methods. And in fact, they kind of build on each other. So we were sort of switching back and forth in our, in our logic and understanding when we talked about the qualitative picture. And that's uh, the better you can do that qualitative picture and understand the graphs, the more information you'll have to fall back on in terms of, uh, in terms of this sort of approach. And when you get to more complicated circuits, you, can, you should always be able to rely on just writing down the differential equation and solving them and using the, uh, the intuition that you have about capacitors and resistors that comes from just thinking about solving these a lot of times in a lot of different ways. Continuing on with LR circuit, so considering this same circuit here, we can do the analogous thing to what we did with the capacitor circuit and solve it using a time constant, except this time the time constant is L over R. We can also solve it by the differential equation method using Kirchhoff's laws and writing out our voltage on the inductor in terms of L times the rate of change of current. And we can also solve it intuitively. I'm gonna talk you through the intuitive one and leave the other ones as a, as a bit of exercise if you'd like to go through those in more detail. So the intuitive one, let's, let's get a sense for how the inductor behaves. When the inductor, when we first turn on this voltage, then what does the inductor prevent? Well, it prevents changes in current. So initially the current was, uh, was zero. There was nowhere for there to be a current flow. Um, uh, whereas the capacitor example, we had to be told how much the capacitor, how much voltage was on the capacitor initially. In the inductor one, you can tell by the geometry here, as long as the output's not connected, that there's no current going through the inductor at the start. So you close the switch. What's the current right after you close the switch? Well, it's still zero. The inductor current can't change instantly. So the current's initially zero. Uh, 
what does that mean? It means that the voltage on the inductor must be equal to the voltage in the, on the supply. So initially the back EMF is large enough to prevent any instantaneous change in current and it completely cancels out this uh, the voltage from the supply. But we also know that the voltage is equal to the rate of change of current in the inductor. Voltage is equal to L times del I by del T. So the bigger the voltage, the bigger the rate of change of current. Bigger the inductance, well, the smaller the rate of change of current. A bigger inductor will uh, not uh, need as much of a rate of change of current for a given voltage. Anyway, the whatever the size of the inductor, slowly but surely the current is increasing through the inductor. As that increases, it starts to get that current through the resistor and goes along with the uh, the voltage change across the resistor. So the voltage on the resistor is always equal to the current going through the resistor uh, related, or at least proportional to it through the resistance. So then what's happening is as the current increases, the voltage starts to drop and more and more of the voltage appears across the resistor. The steady state value is that we just have a current of uh, V divided by R and the inductor is behaving like a wire. Integrator and differentiator circuits. So this circuit is considered an integrator. Why is it considered an integrator? Well, let's solve for the voltage change that we get here and figure out what the output voltage is related to the input voltage. Now, the using the capacitor rule, we get an output voltage, which is, uh, is modeled by this equation. So the output voltage plus RC times the rate of change of the output voltage is equal to the input voltage. Now, if the rate of change of the, so if the input is rapidly changing, if the input is changing quickly, then the output voltage term is going to be changing quickly as well and will, uh, will be dominated by this derivative term. And so at least in that range where it's changing, uh, where it's rapidly changing, we find that this circuit behaves in a way where the output's derivative is related to the input. So in other words, the output is equal to the initial output plus the integral of the input over time. This kind of keeps track of what's going on uh, over long periods of time. And in a way, this buffers, um, buffers away small signal changes in the input. So if the input is kind of jumping around a little bit, the capacitor is not going to let that happen. It's going to make most of that be absorbed across the resistor and sink whatever fast current it needs to sink so that the output is going to be more stable. This is the reason that you typically see capacitors in uh, in audio circuits, among other things. It turns out it's difficult to get really large inductors, even more so than it is to get really large capacitors. But really large capacitors are useful for smoothing out the voltage that we have here. Uh, now, differentiator circuit, just reverse the order of this. You could also take a resistor and, uh, and an inductor, and that would do the opposite. Now, in this circumstance, in this configuration, we got a capacitor up here, a resistor up here, proceeding the same way. Now, suppose that the input signal is changing slowly and see what happens. Well, as the, as the input signal is changing slowly, then the output voltage is, uh, we can neglect this dot term next to the non-time derivative. And so in this equation, we find that the input, the output is related to RC times the derivative of the input. So these work as long as you work in the, in the time range when, uh, when they're appropriate for now. Let's, uh, we'll see these a little bit later when we look at AC things. Exercise 2.4. What's the inductance of the conductor shown in figure 2.11 consisting of two long straight wire segments of length L in a single loop? So it goes length L from there to there, length L from there to there. Assume it's reasonable to treat each wire as infinitely long and ignore end effects. So just they're only infinitely long for the purpose of ignoring the end effects. They're actually length L. Take the radius of wire of each wire as B and the distance between the wires as A and then assume that A is much larger than B. So the wires themselves are small, but not infinitesimally thin. They have a radius of B. Give it a shot. All right. So the if you want to hint, then what you want to do is find the magnetic field created by one wire as a function of the distance from it. You can get that equation and then use that to figure out the, uh, the magnetic 
flux through the uh, the loop there and use that to calculate the back EMF. So magnetic field is that magnetic flux. That part goes from the uh, radius of the wire now up to the center of the other wire. Second wire contributes flux in the same direction over the same uh, same amount. So the total flux is given by this. We're kind of neglecting the the flux in the interior of the wires for now. We'll look at that in just a minute. The voltage drop is this part. And so the length, or rather the inductance, is equal to mu naught length divided by pi ln A over B. If we do account for the current inside the wire, then it goes with the square of the radius, assuming a uniform current density inside the wire. So this would give you the current as a function of R, then you can uh, you can calculate what the magnetic field produced by this current would be using the same expression as before, but with a different current, and say what the magnetic field would be inside the wire. So the magnetic field inside the wire increases with radius r. Then you get a little extra component of the flux due to the inside part of the wire, and the contribution to the inductance from both wires then is this which implies that the inductance over these, this new inductance is 2 ln of A over B, which means the magnetic field inside the wire is negligible as long as A is much bigger than B. Exercise 2.6. Determine the voltage and current at all times for the circuit shown in figure 2.14 if the switch is closed at time 0. Pretty standard stuff. Something we uh, very similar to one of the circuits we looked at earlier. Give it a shot. Okay, so uh, just qualitatively looking at it, initially the voltage, uh, we're looking for the voltage on the resistor. So initially all the voltage appears across the resistor because the voltage on the capacitor can't change with time. So the voltage in the capacitor take that to be initially zero and the switch when it is closed, the voltage is still zero. So all that voltage goes across the capacitor. It decays from that initial voltage V naught to its final value of zero according to an RC time constant. So we can just say that it goes from its initial value of V to its final value of zero according to RC time constant. Or if you like, you can calculate the, uh, find the differential equation and then go about solving that to find your answer.